Live today, we are introducing a new program to the Being an Engineer podcast to recognize engineers who excel in their field. Go to teampipeline.us slash excellence and fill out the form with the name of your nominee and a short description of what makes him or her deserving of the award. Winners will be announced and recognized on the show and will receive some complimentary Being an Engineer podcast swag. The program is live right now. Go to teampipeline.us slash excellence and give an engineer the recognition he or she deserves. One thing is that brings you joy is just the process of creation, seeing something materialize. Uh, holding that uh, product in your hand, having it perform as you expected or even better, it's probably the, the biggest joy of all. Welcome to another episode of the Being an Engineer podcast. Today, we're speaking with Milan Serovic, who spent over 25 years at Taser as a designer and NPD manager. Milan now works as the VP of R&D at RAP, where they empower law enforcement officers with innovative training and tools to take individuals safely into custody without having to use force and reducing the risk of injury to subjects and to officers. Milan, thank you so much for joining me today. No, thank you for inviting me. Well, what made you decide originally to pursue a career in product development? Well, basically, I think you know, since the early days of schooling, uh, growing up in Europe, we had a technical education classes in elementary school, then that transpires into making a selection for your profession when you attend the high school. High schools over there are very specific, medical, technical, chemistry. So I chose a technical high school and then uh, everything took its own course after that. Interesting. Okay. And, and you're from, is it Serbia? Uh, basically, I was former Yugoslavia. Yes, I was born in Sarajevo. And then uh, after the country split apart, I uh, came to US in 94. Okay. And and uh, growing up, I mean, did you always know that that's kind of what you wanted to get into as, as a profession, the like engineering, product development, design space? Yes, yes. I, I think uh, my dad's a carpenter. So having access to all type of tools when you were really young, uh. start making things. And then uh, I have a couple of cousins in the electronics industries, a couple of cousins in mechanical engineering. So had access to some of the very minimal, but some of the exposure to those disciplines. And then uh, everything uh, kind of clicked in when I started taking the, the classes in elementary school and then see like, hey, what's the difference with electrical and mechanical engineering? So mechanical engineering, particularly design, was the main interest. So, And, and you took that in elementary school? Yeah, we have a, basically a small, what do you call it, technical education classes. Wow. It's a small amount of exposure to everything. Like we are wiring some small, uh, like a very simple uh, lighting circuits. And then you are making uh, almost like a Lego robotic sets and uh, carving things. And basically they expose you a little bit of technical science. Oh, that's great. I, I wish they had that here. I think the first time I was formally introduced to engineering, at, at least within an academic environment, was college. It would have been amazing if I had some kind of courses earlier on, even in high school. Uh, I mean, I had like physics and stuff in high school. We got to build some fun things there, but it wasn't, you know, formally based like engineering or, or, or really technical. All right. Well, um, what, what's been one of the most exciting or, or just interesting projects that, that you've worked on in your career? Uh, like you said, I spent the uh, majority of my career uh, working for Taser Exxon, and uh, most interesting projects were most likely, if I can compare them, uh, our first foray into uh, modern uh, design uh, CEWs, uh, conducted energy weapons, broke ground there, then worked with an awesome team on camera design, and then now we did the same type of thing, modernizing Bola Rep 150 device, looking at the Bola 100 existing device, purely mechanical, very cumbersome, hard to make. We can like, you know, gave it an overhaul and made that. So between those three projects, they kind of start the whole category of products following behind them. And I was fortunate enough and blessed enough to be in the uh, forefront of those developments. Yeah. Uh, those three projects encompass what, like uh, over 25 years, 25 to 30 years of, yeah. of, of work, right? I mean, those are huge. And yes. anything, 
um, and any, I don't know, like small subsets, something you worked on for uh, a month or a, a few months that, that come to mind as being like particularly challenging or, or interesting or fulfilling? Uh, in particular, right now at RAP, the most, uh, I think, challenging part was uh, redesigning the uh, cassette, the basically uh, a, a holder for the RAP Kevlar and the anchors in our new product. The previous one was like aluminum machine, the blank inside, very, very cumbersome, uh, uh, very crude. We went into uh, using the technology used in um, uh, airbag initiators, redesigned the anchors, plastic metal hybrid mix, probably more in line in a uh, uh, manufacturing technology used today rather than have to machine everything for one-time use. So that was kind of challenging. Additional projects that were kind of, Fun that took a little bit of time. Probably the first concept of the body cam that that we did almost like as a, as a side project. We weren't even supposed to work on it. One of my colleagues from Exxon, and then presented that saying, "Hey, we took basically we took the taser cam, the the, the camera that was mounted underneath the taser devices, and wrapped it around and create a housing and a carrier to put it on a chest, and then." Uh, so, so we had a couple of those interesting projects. Uh, taser X twenty six. Uh, Taser M26, like working against some big companies, kind of like having my own ideas and kind of stacked up against uh, larger, more experienced teams and kind of winning some of design aspects and winning design over. That was kind of fun. Tell me a little bit more about the the camera at Taser X on it. You said you weren't even supposed to be working on it. How did how did that even come to be? Well, the the, the, the Taser was the first company who launched uh, on officer video cameras uh, that were basically attached to our bottom of our devices. And the one drawback of that is uh, devices are mostly pointing down at the ground to de-escalate situations. So we got a lot of good video, but mostly good audio. Mm. So at the time, we were looking into different type of wearable devices. Uh, most of the emphasis was carrying the camera on the head because the head uh, basically follows the eyes. So you can have a first eye view of the police officers. But then uh, somebody said, what about these body-worn cameras? Uh, the, everything on, on the market is too cumbersome, big, or very small, kind of like a hobbyist. So mm-hmm. we said, you already have a good camera. So why don't we just make a concept to show off to our team how, how should I say, robust, adequate, still size kind of changes you can make it. So it was one of those like a weekend slash afternoon projects because we were still focusing on the body-worn cameras and with all the – all the following uh, uh, or corresponding uh, carrying options. But this was more like, hey, let's do this for fun and show that we can do something else as well. Nice. And, and was it a pretty simple process once you had the prototype in place and showed it to the rest of the team? Did they jump on board pretty quickly or, or was there a lot of you know push that you had to do in order to convince people that this is the right solution? Yeah, yeah. I, 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 think, I think once we start uh, talking about it, uh, very early on, the, the, the path was chosen to combine the controller functions for both head cams and body cams to be on the body. So imagine just the imager being on a head, everything else is on a body. So just putting imager back onto the body uh, device, you get the camera almost for free. So so that was that, that fun part of modular development. So one thing is design and conceptualization. And one thing is real development. You really sit down and talk about like, hey, what do we really try to accomplish and what can we get out of it as well? So, yeah. Well, I, I love uh, stories like that uh, because it, it shows the the innovation of the engineering team, right? It, the leadership team wasn't necessarily asking you to go do this. You just thought, hey, I think this is a, a better solution. And so pulled a group of engineers together and got something designed. And, and uh, lo and behold, that turned out to be the solution that the company went with. Yeah, but it was more to show the human element of the camera. How, what basic functions do we need? Why overcomplicate or undermine certain functions? So once you have something you can show and pass around and test and record, it's much easier than talking about it like mood boards are fine and uh, sketches are fine. But once you have something you can actually turn on, basically put it on your chest or your lapel and then see, hey, how the angles look like? What is the aiming look like? How the, how the user, the operator, the end uh, subject will treat that particular product. That was invaluable. You know, of course, that was so primitive in approach what the real product looked like, but it gave us an opportunity to say what type of lens we need, what type of uh, commands, gloves, uh, 
you know, what type of a basic functions that camera should have. So all the subsequent projects kind of follow the, you know, in the same pattern. Yeah. The value of having a, a physical prototype to pass around looks like, feels like. Well, uh, you have so much experience working with product development teams. Um, in, in your experience, what are a few common ways that engineering teams mess up product development? Oh, yeah, there's, there's more than one. Yeah. Uh, if, if I can basically, sometimes it's lack of direction. Uh, basically, if, if you don't have a good requirements, I would consider that the research. Don't call it development. And that's, I think, the biggest stigma that kind of leads in a second reason why engineering messes up. We can do really, how should I say, exceptional things in research, make things look and perform as the real product. The problem is there's no content behind them. We usually don't pay attention to durability, sealing, uh, modularity, disassembly, assembly when we're doing research. So if you don't define that, you can spend years doing research and still miss it. And then second thing is once we present the particular development to uh, additional stakeholders, project managers, product managers, and so on, if they don't understand what you're showing them, they'll either diminish its you know, how should I say functionality saying, oh, this is not good enough or accept it as a face value. Oh, this is ready to go. So besides that, in my mind, just setting expectations, right? Of course, technical prowess, tools used, that all plays the role. But if you don't know what you're really trying to do, it's the hardest thing then to outline the path towards getting there. You know, how should I say a lot of time frame, money, function, feature set. So, so I think the majority of projects that were challenging were the ones that we set up with one set of intent and one set of goals. And then middle of the project, they start evolving without everybody else knowing why they're evolving. Is it a cost? Is it a time frame? Is it a feature set? So that's very demoralizing. And when you have engineers that demoralize, most of engineers are perfectionists and slightly OCD, they just lose interest. And that's devastating. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what have you found to be an appropriate balance of uh, speaking about requirements documents, mm-hmm. um, uh, finding those requirements based on rigorous market research, uh, whether it be, you know, uh, user discussion groups or, or things like that versus, um, the engineering team comes up with, well, we think that it should have these requirements, that this is what the user really wants. It, it seems like there's always some mix of, of the two. Have you found that it, it really needs to be heavily biased towards one side or the other, or or is there generally like just kind of like a 50-50 mix? You know, uh, for the industry we are in, honestly speaking, it's a, it's a, it's a very, how should I say, narrow band of things you can do. You have to wor- wor- you know, worry about durability, the appearance, functionality, effectiveness. It's, you know, it's very professional-based products. I kind of work mostly for law enforcement products. Uh, what I would say, you cannot go to customers for everything. So you have to outline key strategists in the company. They can be from engineering. They can be from sales. They can be from, um, from management. But somebody who is basically having the finger on the pulse of the, of the, of the market. So ask two questions. What do we have? What type of problem does it solve? Can we make a better mousetrap to solve a better problem? And then what other problems customers, current customers have, they don't even know about? Because once you have access to a large group of individuals, professional or a civilian, you will start observing their behavior, especially around your product, but then also around other products. So I think setting up the requirements First, it has to come from somebody, if it's a new product, from somebody who is almost like uncovering the problem. Engineering can do that, but engineers, we don't go out uh, to talk to customer that much. At least, you know, uh, you can have opportunities to do that as well if you are more of a research engineer. But uh, engineering requirements are really good for a spin-off or, or, or a Rev B or, or evolutionary products. Hmm. But for initial ones, it has to be a good mix of a promoters of new ideas, a strategist. Like I said, they can be from engineering as well. And a key core of engineers understanding the technology you want to play with. And once you create the requirements document, accept it as a living document. It will change. So in my career, I think the best 
projects were the one they were run to some type of quality function deployment. It's a term from automotive industry. We kind of like took it and deconstructed it a little bit. It came from Ford. I guess they created a vehicle that was awesome. Nobody wanted to buy it because the engineers put everything they want, but the customer's like, well, I don't know what this really means. <laughs> so they created these, these like charts saying, hey, you know what? Let's see customers' watch to engineering house. You make a chart and then you kind of rate the features and then you flip that chart and basically assign risk ratings and value ratings to the engineering house. Hmm. And then you present that to management to say, hey, you want this to get that, the outline these features and to achieve these features, these are the risks I the lift. And then that's what makes that requirements document, living documents. Once the, once the engineering presents that, being brutally honest, uh, I think everybody who's involved, uh, I'm saying management, not the company management, project management, product management, can sit down and say, hey, which of these features we need depending on the risk, cost, and time. Those are the best projects. And then if you can give that to system engineering group, they can develop a set of tests for each development phase. You keep brutal honesty alive. So once you split the, the tasks to more digestible tasks to teams, then we track them, test through our SPs, DVTs, EVTs, PVTs. And if anybody is lacking either uh, execution, like we can't just achieve what we set to achieve, other teams can help because everybody knows what everybody else is doing. So in my experience, that was probably the best way to run the project without destroying it. So outline what you want to do. Knowing you may change it, it will change. There will be points that we can probably do some trade-offs. And then clearly outline who does what. Other than that, you know, like a small team like right now, Trap, a couple of people, we do everything. But it's very easy because we don't have too many, uh, you know, like uh, requirements. We have requirements that we set based on a ball of one. 100. So you can see kind of like, you know, from, from those type of products, like evolutionary products, engineering is probably the most capable outlining what needs to happen. We have something, we have to make it better. But when you're trying to make something kind of like based on a, some type of a problem somebody needs to solve or identify, it, it's best to have all teams involved, engineering, operations, product and program management assuming one of those teams will have the strategists on board. Yeah, that's great. Um, let's say that you're about to start a new project. So you have a requirements document in place. You know um, what it is you're supposed to develop, design. What, what What's your mental checklist for, for starting the design and development phases? Like, What, what are some of the best practices that, that you go through at the beginning of a project? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, depending on a project, uh, it would be nice to know the timeline and probably projected cost because ultimately in most of the projects, field work, everything comes down to those two. And then expectations. Who is your strategist? Are, are the strategists driving the project more on a functional side, more appearance side, or somewhere in between? And then seriously, like, like I mentioned before, it would be nice to kind of outline what are the most critical, uh, you know, system performance functions you need to achieve? And then prototype those very early. Spend money on prototyping those to a highest fidelity, you know. If it's, a, if it's a switch, if it's a slider, if it's a laser, if it's a light, if it's a, a, a outside design, prototype that in your, in your SP phase, system prototype phase. Because if you show that, like, hey, people want to have uh, 15 different switches to test, do it early. Because once you select something, then you can integrate it later. In a, in a parallel, if you have latitude in a team, it's nice to start doing the packaging, like skin overs over some basic components to see what it can look like. If you can basically perform those two functions, more like industrial design and design engineering on one end, like systemic, and then outline the best portions or most critical portions of the system and prototype those very early on, once you meet those two it's very easy to go to your DVT design verification test saying, hey, now I have to merge them to some type of prototype, but at least I know what everybody selected. Otherwise, it's a lot of repetition on a higher scale of system builds. So it's much, much easier to cherry pick the most important things. It goes for electrical too. I mean, I work with electrical guys and, you know, a lot of times we make breadboards and fail and, you know, basically smoke them off and, you know, do it on a, on, on a nondescript flat panel big components, basically give yourself a chance to iterate rather than, you know, like we said, run, run, stop, 
get to a shape and size, get to the form factor, and then you fail. Then what? You first spend a lot of time getting there. Second thing, you almost desensitize the, 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 your customers, internal or external, on what it can be. It's very hard to backtrack from that. So, so that's in my experience probably that what I would like to do is outline who are the customers, how many teams we have, and then identify the most critical components for success and prototype those first, work on those first, analyze those first. You mentioned industrial design. What have you found is the um, – uh, how do I say this? I guess the, the hierarchy between industrial design and engineering. Is it often the industrial design that kind of leads the engineering or is it the, the technical development, the engineering that, that then um, informs and leads the industrial design or, or is it some kind of mix? I think it's a mix and, and probably from experience as well. Uh, there are different uh, types of designers, engineers. So, most of the product development engineers that work on something that human hand is going to touch, something that has going to have human factors involved, are also becoming industrial designers. Because our CAD package are so powerful right now that, you know, industrial designers can help maybe outline a familiarity with a line of products, uh, you know, company's main look, feel, touch. But then a majority of engineering uh, designers I worked, engineers I worked, they have a strong propensity towards uh, exploring industrial design aspects in our own design CAD softwares, and they are getting better and better. So, so, uh, so yes, I would, I would think the best uh, approach I found is try to, almost like in a free space, put all the components that need to be in there and then give it to either industrial designers or somebody who has more that industrial design mindset to wrap some skin over. And then either working coherently or kind of letting somebody else take care of it, assign, you know, certain amount of textures, colors, materials, and prototype very early, either through like some of those, like a key shot type, um, uh, almost like a augmented reality uh softwares or the real 3D prints and then spend some time with the uh, painting, assigning colors and everything else to get the real good uh, handheld model. I think the, the line is getting really blurred. A lot of industrial designers, when they finish school, they jump straight into engineering softwares and start design. And then a lot of engineers, when they start getting introduced to the capabilities of, this, of the softwares that they work on, their designs almost by default take a lot of industrial design aspects taking care of like a you know like a beauty lines and details and yeah, textures yeah. it's it's like i said in the last probably 10 years it's getting really blurry who who leads what yeah yeah uh, one of our industrial designers is really good at general mechanical design as well in, fa in fact i'd say he's quite a bit faster um in, in certain tasks than uh, most of our engineers, especially when it comes to something like consumer product design, and we're designing injection molding and putting bosses and ribs on the inside and things like that. Just super fast and, and very, very technically uh, skilled. Um, let's see. Uh, what what general skills do you think are most important to being a, a successful engineer? General skills or characteristics, traits? You know, if you think about, especially in, in, in a line of products, I think we both are basically the product development uh, for everyday use, either professional or in uh, civilian or, or, or uh, uh, basically consumer world. I think first people have to have a, an eye for detail. And then I think one of the best traits is to have propensity to build things, to have somewhat of a mechanical attitude to be able to go in a shop and understand how things are built. Also, I think experience over time uh, gets you more proficient in understanding what other technologies exist. Uh, it's very hard to design out of the box. Uh, and then uh, the one thing I found, at least in my opinion, is, and a lot of engineers are not, is to be organized. You know, in, in every team, you're going to probably have about 50-50 mix, 50% of like a mad scientist and organized engineers and about 50% of like really, you know, good methodical approach engineers. And in my experience, that probably worked the best. I tend to lean on organized side and I like to work with organized people, but, you know, working with, a, like I said, mad scientists that are not really organized worked out fine as long as some of us exist to kind of like not get too defocused when we start getting into new ideas. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, I've uh, certainly worked with engineers, well, lots of engineers who they almost have this intuitive sense, this mechanical aptitude for how to build something, how to use the right tool um, to, to put something together and to create a prototype, maybe um, hack a few parts together to produce some kind of test scenario. Uh, and then on the other end of the spectrum, um, uh, engineers who... Uh, I, I sometimes wonder why they became engineers because they don't yes. like have that aptitude. They're good at other things, right? Like, you know, maybe research or um, uh, documentation or things like that, but they just don't have that innate sense of uh, mechanical aptitude and skill. And, and for um, R and D design and development projects, you know, NPD stuff, you know, it's very clear that, that uh, those with the mechanical aptitude are, are just far more efficient at that work. Yeah, and, and it seems like, like you said, maybe uh, uh, in our education systems, we don't get, how should I say, introduced to some of those classes or opportunities. And then some engineers, especially when I was in the role of, you know, uh, recruiting and hiring some younger engineers for some leadership development programs and engineering development programs, we would get about, you know, 15 to 20 percent of engineers, they just want to go to management, either yeah. the company management or pro program, project management, how you call it. Uh, uh, they just have enough skill to be able to, how should I say, speak coherently and intelligently when they run into project management. They just want to know the basics, almost like a stepping stone, but they will never design. They will never go into a problem solving. They just need to know enough so they can finish MBA or additional like a project management or business classes and say, hey, I will lead the team from that perspective. And you know what? They are needed. Those those individuals are needed. And if they have an engineering background, at least it's easier to explain them the phases, the problems, drawbacks, and so on. So yeah. they encounter that as well. I mean, seriously, kids coming out of prestigious schools, having all the tools necessary, and they just never want to touch anything in, in, in related to MPD as long as it's not management. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm going to take a very short break here and share with the listeners that teampipeline.us is where you can learn more about how we help medical device and other product engineering or manufacturing teams develop turnkey equipment, custom fixtures, and automated machines to characterize, inspect, assemble, manufacture, and perform verification testing on your devices. We're speaking with Milan Serovic today. Um, do you have any favorite vendors, Milan? I mean, uh, folks like, like, or I shouldn't say folks, uh, companies like McMaster or maybe like a particularly great machine shop, uh, vendors that other engineers listening to this might, might be able to use for their NPD programs. Yeah, McMaster, like you mentioned, that that's like a staple. Uh, yeah. Uh, we started working with the Proto Labs very early on. So they're mm. a pretty good resource. Uh, uh, they have a couple of companies in uh, Far East, in China. One is called Premium Parts. One is called Rapid Cut. Extremely well for machining and prototyping. Uh, PADT here in town, really great for uh, 3D printing, prototyping. Yeah. Yeah. Good team of people. Aside from that, uh, sheet metal, I don't know if there are any new players. We used in Kadama extensively. Really good, cool team out of New Jersey. Mm. Electrical components, Mac 8, Presidip, Milmax. So, I mean. Great. That's a great yeah, list. We have, we have, yeah. Yeah, we had a lot. I mean, uh, we were lucky uh, back in early days of Exxon that we had a very technologically promotive uh, management. So they let us buy a CNC and the 3D printer very early on. Wonderful. And at that time, they weren't really popular. They were actually used for dentures. So it was ah. a wax-based. It produced more smoke than parts, but it was great. <laughs> and now, I mean, every engineer can have a 3D printer for, you know, I'm, I'm not saying small amount of money, but, you know, bearable amount of money. Yeah. And, and that, that helps a lot. But there are new yeah. technologies out there. So... Yeah, like I said, if I can uh, just say, there's a couple of really good shows like MDM West. You probably attend that for yep. engineers. There's uh, Shot Show and CES in Vegas are really great, depending which uh, side of the industry you belong. Uh, both Shot and CES have their what they call the vendor pavilion, and most of the times they are only there for a couple of days. If I'm not mistaken, I don't know if anything changed lately. And if you really want to be in this industry, a lot of those guys, by relation electronics. A hunt game, fish, medical, they kind of like all use a 
fairly similar manufacturing methods, MIM, machining, casting, plastics. It's really good to go maybe to those shows. You'll see a lot of same suppliers on those shows, but you would never think they would attend the same show, like Stratasys, different you know people for prototyping. and So, so yeah, it's... Yeah, like I said, we have a lot of these companies. If you can, we need to share. We can share them uh, additionally. But yeah, that's what, that's a great list. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, we just started um, uh, a little while ago working with this company, CNS Engraving, and uh, they just they make labels. You know, and you, n- no one thinks about labels that often, right? Until you need them. But w- we build a lot of machines, and so we need to put labels on them, safety and like callouts for this and that. And they've been wonderful. Custom labels, uh, very affordable, um, great service, quick turnaround time, nice clean labels that you can uh, easily wash off. Everything uh, printed on the back. Well, the ones that we get anywhere printed on the back, and the front is just this nice smooth plastic uh, uh, finish. Anyway, that's that's one recently that that we've discovered and been uh, using quite a bit. They've been great. Yeah, when we developed the cameras, I think one of our engineers said there's basically the project and there's usually cables and labels. You know, something to connect, something to, and then something yeah. to de- denote what's going on inside. So you're right. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> cables and labels. That's good. Cables and labels. Uh, if, if you had to start your career over again, is there anything that you would do differently? Uh I don't know. Really, I, I think I was pretty fortunate to uh, select the field I want to be in and actually, uh, despite everything happening in my life, stumble upon the same opportunities and continue. Uh, the biggest thing is there's always that fine balance between hard work and education. So if I can change something, I would probably invest a little bit more in education, hmm. especially visual communication and certain amount of, uh, you know, Additional facets they are attached to our industry, like procurement, program management, and quality. You kind of learn that as you go, but uh, if I can change it again, I would probably spend a little bit more time on that rather than just working to, to build those skills by just sheer amount of effort and, and labor. Yeah. Tell me a little more about the visual communication. What Specifically, what, what would you do there? The, 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 I mean... The sketching programs, uh, the visual representation programs, I mean, we use SolidWorks here, and it has two modules, like a photo view and what is the other one, I don't know, right on top of my head, for visual communication. Visualize, I think. Yeah, visualize, yes. It's almost, how should I say, it's almost painful to find the training for that. Mm, Yeah. You know? It's, it's, it's very difficult. You can find training for surfacing, for drawings, for weldments and everything else all day long. But like, hey, how can somebody get the engineers to know what's enough, what's appropriate level of knowledge of those programs to get your ideas presented in a proper manner? Yeah. Either through explosion, animation, change of scenery, lighting, texture, materials, because it's very hard to sell. I'm not talking about real sales, but to sell your idea to somebody who cannot visualize it. So I think that will be the, I mean, besides Photoshop's illustrators and all that, that's already existent. But even in, inside of our respective everyday software we use, they are very powerful engines. It's yeah. just very hard to kind of get to portray the value of that. Yeah. And for those who don't know PhotoView and, and now visualize their SolidWorks uh, products that are, are photorealistic rendering programs, uh, KeyShot is another uh, similar oh, yeah, one. That's, and that's like a, there's an excellent one. Yeah, Modo and Maxwell Render, and there are a bunch of them out there. But KeyShot and, and Visualize, I I think of as kind of the same. Um, they're they're built around uh, ease of use. You know, for for folks who aren't in um, uh, uh, who who don't have you know immense amounts of training in in, in uh, creating your own material in, in a digital environment and things like that, they just make it really really easy to uh, to create a, a photorealistic render of something. And you know, within a few minutes, you can get something that looks pretty good, pretty realistic, and then show it off. Uh, well, Let's talk about habits a little bit. What, what are some habits um, that you have developed over the years that have proven useful to, to you? Could be um, professional or personal. Uh, take your pick. Yeah, that's a good question. I, I think that one of the most, how should I say, important habits that I still kind of sometimes force, my, force myself to kind of like adhere to is 
punctuality and finishing what I start. Hmm. Okay. It's, it's almost like procrastination is different. I mean, that's kind of like almost like a subset, but like if you like to start too many things and never finish them, I saw that as a really big detriment. You, you always play catch up. And then you always have an excuse. Well, I couldn't do this because I did this. So as much as I can, even in my personal life and in my professional, I don't try. I try not to start too many things at the same time. Almost like if I'm not going to be focused, I can be really good at maybe one to two things. I can be average in about three to four. Everything above that, I'm going to fail. And I know that. Uh, I, I just have that like OCD personality. I just cannot run too many things at the same time. I just don't have enough I should say latitude or, or, or so so that's the one habit is like I want to really get things under control, kind of send them off and then start a new thing. So so I think that's the one habit, you know, that I kind of call cherish. But but my personal habits is like I'm a morning person, so I like to kind of get everything non essential out of the basically um, out of my sight in the morning. So my rest of the day is more focused on because when you, your attention span goes down and everything else, it's much nicer to be focused on single thing like your CAD or design or test or build, rather than like you have to stand up every three minutes, go check the email or somebody's calling yeah. you. So get those out. Yeah. So wake up early, get all emails out, you know, and then your kind of like a middays to afternoons become much more productive. Hopefully, using one of these helps. I like them a lot. So, <laughs> so just focus on what you need to do. Do you uh, do you often check email just once a day in the morning, or or will you go back a couple times throughout the day? I will go back, but I will kind of like a tune down the frequency towards the end of the day. First, I cannot do much about it anyhow unless something urgent. Mm. And second thing, there's always tomorrow. I'll, I'll do it in the morning anyhow. Yeah, yeah. The, the, the biggest the biggest I think challenge is the foreign suppliers, the mm, mostly right. Asian that they hopefully try to go to ho- go home. So some of those, you may have to leave some time around six or seven in the afternoon and talk to them for an hour, but yeah. Okay. Other than that. <laughs> Can you think of a, uh, a failure that you've had in your career and, and, uh, what did you learn from that failure? Uh, majority. Yeah. There were, there were, there were definitely a few, um, failures in, in design and execution, uh, pa, pa, pa. I can't think in, in, in any particular ones. It's mostly, you mostly fix them in testing, but it's basically almost like a, a trying to attempt to do too much without doing enough research hmm, or okay. not including other team members for advisement. So majority of my failures were lack of communication with other team members doing enough of a design reviews and design inspections. Okay. Yeah. And sometimes it's it's a necessity because there's nobody around, and then you just don't know enough about it. So you kind of like you know say, hey, this is what I can do right now, and then it just does not accomplish what you set to accomplish. Uh, but that's probably the most like taking how should I say risk unnecessarily, or mm-hmm. diving into something that's not your expertise without doing enough research. Yeah. All right. Well, you've been doing this for just so long that I, I, I really want to kind of dive into your brain and, and extract some of your experiences and knowledge and, and, and insights. And, and one of the questions that I found um, interesting to do that is, is the following. What's, what's your biggest fear when you walk into work each morning? What are you worried about every day? Oh, that's, that's an interesting question. Honestly speaking, I love what I do. So I really don't have any type of fear of of items related to direct work. Try to kind of like, you know, understand what you need to do, plan for it, prepare for it, and always look from two perspectives. What's the worst that can happen and what's the best that can happen? And kind of towards gravitate towards what's the best that can happen. The, 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 the biggest fear for me was like basically something happening outside of our control. You know, uh, some of our team members leaving, some of our uh, project scope changing, uh, something that we put enough effort into it will not come to a proper fruition. But other than that, seriously, like I said, uh, the, the, the work is one of the things I really enjoy and uh, the creation process I really enjoy. So, like I said, the biggest thing is something happening outside of control of our team yeah. that we have to respond to. That can really set everything else in motion. 
Totally. Yeah. You, you mentioned uh, a team member leaving. That's definitely one of mine. W- one of our talented engineers leaving. That's, I, I, this is something I worry about all the time for me. That's a big one. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. What, um, what's a tool that doesn't exist, but if it did, would allow engineering teams to work better, faster, smarter. And, and this can be, this can even be outside the, the realms of what is physically possible. I think someone uh, to this question once answered a, uh, a teleportation machine, which, which I thought was just <laughs> brilliant. <laughs> but uh, yeah. any thoughts there? A tool that doesn't exist that, that, that should to make engineering faster, better. Well, Actually, there are a couple of tools we actually discussed. One was the the, the mode flow slash FEA tool. Like mm-hmm. a lot of times you have mode flow models for your plastic parts that show everything that lines uh, pockets, uh, uh, heat, uh, hot, cold zones, and everything else. But then when you do FEA, it gives you a perfect model. Hex mesh, no problems. Why can't we just take that model from uh, mode flow, put it in FEA, and get the better results? So I think that's probably in the works. We talked to a couple of companies uh, about that, uh, and I don't know if they're going to be doing it or not. So that was like a, like a really interesting like engineering tool. Of course, all these parametric modelers, different modelers, they are getting better. The other tool it would be nice is a better project schedule tool. Hmm. Not really for engineering, but I think the biggest frustration for engineers is we set a schedule in place, and if anything goes how should I say, not according to plan. It's extremely hard to change the schedule and make everybody understand. So if if you ask me, I would like to have uh, almost like a project schedule that can almost reflect our thoughts, almost like have a movie attached to a schedule. Hey, this happened, and if you don't fix it, this is going to happen. I think the most of the time engineers spend is explaining why is schedule like this or like that or not on time or too much takes and everything else, interdependencies. If somebody can solve the engineering scheduling better to make it easier for engineers, they are very visual and how should I say uh, hands-on individuals, I think that'll be helpful, you know, just from my perspective. Yeah, oh, that's really interesting. M- maybe you need to get some of your old body cams and upload that directly to the Gantt chart. Yeah, <laughs> imagine if you can have like a almost like a AI CAD that you can attach to schedule. Say, hey, here we are right now. Here's where we're going, but this is a problem. So everybody can visualize what you see every day. So I don't know if it yeah. makes any sense, but I think a lot of times just having to explain all of that in digestible terms and be asked a lot of questions that you can't answer frustrates engineers, myself included, saying, hey, you know what, we will put the best schedule forward. We won't fluff it, make it like super long, taking care of the account. We won't risk it. So trust us, this is probably the best snapshot we have right now. If anything changes, we'll adjust it. Once you start adjusting, people just lose the track. It's like a million lines and everything else. It'd be nice almost like to make it as a something as three-dimensional, like a movie or a model, so people can see, hey, hmm. here we right now, I mean, you tell them, hey, step tooling is being made. They have no idea what you're talking about. Or, hey, a a circuit board needs to be revised. For them, circuit board needs to be revised. It's it's like me listening to a foreign language. So (laughs) so, so what I'm saying is, like, it'd be nice to have something that's more immersive so everybody understands what happens. But, like, those are my initial thinking, just because that's most or most of a, how should I say, uh, non-productive time is spent is adjusting some of those. Well, maybe that can be your next company. <laughs> maybe, yes, maybe. <laughs> um, uh, we were talking about uh, – well, you mentioned uh, FEA, mold flow analysis, mm-hmm. and then we were also talking about uh, vendors just a few minutes ago. I thought of a- another vendor that I just found recently called SimScale. Um, super interesting. They they do uh, you know F- FEA, uh, CFD, um, um, uh, nonlinear analysis, like uh, all the different simulation uh, systems, and it, it's cloud based. And you, you just, uh, I think there, there are SolidWorks and probably other CAD mm-hmm. package uh, add ins so that it's, you know, pretty seamless transfer of data into the cloud and, and back to your computer. But, um, 
as opposed to having to pay, you know, I don't know, ANSYS is probably like 13 grand a year or something like that at this point. They're, it's really expensive, right? Um, SolidWorks simulation, I think, is around there, eight or 10 grand to, mm-hmm. to buy it and then many thousands to maintain. Anyway, uh, I th- you just pay like, like, um, a, a monthly fee or, or maybe there's even a, a pay as you use it, like pay for the, the data or the time it takes or something like that. But it, it's just it seems like a really cool way to do a lot of different simulations without having Having to pay 10, 15 grand uh, just to get into it, right? Because maybe you only need to use it, you know, once a month or, or maybe not even that much. And so it seems like a pretty cool vendor that uh, I was looking into, SimScale. That is excellent. Yeah, I'm going to try to use them because we talked about so many times exactly in the, in, in the basically as the aftermath of our initial conversations. Uh, we were lucky to find a, 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 a small company uh, here in Arizona called ARA. It's a husband and wife team, and they're both like professors of math and physics. So they have a bunch of these softwares that they offer these services. But oh, we also cool. always had a seat of, of, of one of those uh, modelers or uh, analysis softwares in, in-house. And you're right. They are utilized about maybe 10% of the time when it's yeah. needed. So we always push these companies. Why did you make it as a SaaS, software as a service? And they would never budge. So I'm glad that somebody else is doing it, and yeah. rightfully so. Yeah, yeah. It's that's. A great idea. We've needed this for a long time. So, all right. Um, maybe just w- one more question, and then we'll we'll wrap things up here. Uh, s- specifically within the context of of your role in design and, and engineering, what's one thing that frustrates you, and one thing that brings you joy? Hmm. Ah, I need to think about this one. One thing is that brings you joy is just a process of creation, seeing something materialize. Uh, holding that uh, product in your hand, having it perform as you expected or even better, it's probably the, the biggest joy of all. The frustration for me usually comes in, in, in probably lack of response from some um, outside factors. Like expecting good prototypes, they come in, they're not really good. Uh, mm. A time frame, hey, we're going to ship these tomorrow, and then it's like five days later, you get the shipment and everything else. In the development portion of the of the, of the the project development, the other frustration is when you develop a product that nobody wants to buy. We had some of those mm. just yeah. because you missed target in initial, like you talked about, in the requirements and everything else. One of the... One well, of the first camera systems we worked on was too big because people insisted to have a, a large screen on it. And the engineering team was saying, we don't need it. It's too big. It basically wastes battery. And then, yes, we launched and nobody wanted it. So it was very frustrating. You know, if you don't know something and you learn when you fail, it's okay. We had those. I mean, we had uh, different failures. And even this pro- you know, pr- uh, project I'm talking about, we learned a lot how to do things. But... When you have a, a notion that something is not okay and you even provide the data, not just your own inclination or opinion, and then nobody else listens and it happens, the first thing is you can say, I told you so. It doesn't help anything. But that frustration remains. Like, why or why we just didn't do it a little bit differently and have a better success um, out of that undertaking, out of that process? Yeah. Well, that's great. Milan, thank you so much for, for joining me today. Um, I really appreciate you taking time out of your schedule and, and sharing some insight from all your years of experience. Uh, how can people get in touch with you? Well, first, thank you for inviting me. This is uh, really a pleasure. And then uh, the best way is probably to LinkedIn. Okay. It's like becoming de facto the standard for communication between professionals. So why not? Yeah. Yeah. All right. We'll, we'll put a link to your LinkedIn profile in the show notes so people can find that easily. All right. Well, Milan, thank you again so much. I, I sure appreciate your time today. Thank you very much. And we'll talk soon. I'm Aaron Moncur, founder of Pipeline Design and Engineering. If you liked what you heard today, please share the episode. To learn how your team can leverage our team's expertise developing turnkey equipment, custom fixtures, and automated machines, and with product design, visit us at teampipeline.us. Thanks for listening.